Hi, I'm Jacob Hornberger, President of the Future of Freedom Foundation, and this is this week's issue of the Libertarian Angle. I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Richard Ebeling, who teaches economics at the Citadel. Richard, welcome back. It's great to be with you and our viewers once more. Yeah, me too. Uh, Richard, I thought we would come into your area of expertise this week, and that is dealing with Federal Reserve policy. Um, as many of our viewers know, you've written... Um, many, many books and articles and given lots of speeches on Austrian economics. You teach economics at the Citadel. You were the Ludwig von Mises Professor of Economics at, the, at Hillsdale College. You were president of the Foundation for Economic Education. And you've done this fantastic book for the Future of Freedom Foundation called Monetary Central Planning in the State, which is selling really well on Amazon. And then you've got this new series coming out for FFF on an introduction to Austrian economics and also with a video presentation as well as an ebook. So there are a few people I think that are more qualified to talk about the Federal Reserve and its policies than you. And recently the Federal Reserve was decided that it was going to leave interest rates alone. The, the rumors in the market were that they were going to finally increase interest rates for the, I think for the first time since the 2008 debacle, uh, the housing crisis, the mortgage crisis. Uh, but then at the last minute, they suddenly decided to leave interest rates alone. Why don't you give us your perspective as to what's going on here with, with Fed policy? Well, l let me sort of pick up a uh a phrase that you just used um, that perhaps could cause confusion and ambiguity. And that is, you said the Federal Reserve has chosen to leave interest rates alone. Now, to leave interest rates alone means that there is a attempt to interest rates and the market sets interest rate. The interaction and the higgling, the haggling in the financial markets between those who set aside part of their income as savings and those who want to borrow other people's savings for various investment and related uh, purposes. So the interaction of borrowers and, and, and lenders. Uh, the fact is, is that in that meaning of leaving interest rates alone, the Federal Reserve never leaves interest rates alone. Uh, the current crisis through which we have been attempting to recover uh, was uh, caused by precisely Federal Reserve manipulation of interest rates. Uh, again, just to give a little historical context before we deal more with the current situation. Uh, in, in the beginning of this century, that is the, around 2001, 2002, the then chairman of the Federal Reserve, Ben uh, Alan Greenspan, and a senior uh, Federal Reserve board member, Ben, ben Bernanke, both concluded that uh, the American economy was threatened with deflation, which they were defining as a sustained period of falling prices. And they viewed falling prices as potentially synonymous with the Great Depression of the early 1930s. Falling prices means uh, uh, less revenue, falling profits. Falling profits means you let workers off on the rising unemployment and falling production, and the economy goes into a tailspin. So they were saying that falling prices equals a depression. Now, that ain't necessarily so. but. Before we get maybe to uh, 2001, uh, and certainly after 2002, uh, the Federal Reserve uh, decided to undertake a significant monetary expansion to reverse any possibility of price deflation. So that between 2003 and 2008, uh, the Federal Reserve expanded the money supply. Again, they use different measurements, so depending upon how you measure uh, the money supply in the U.S., but approximately between 2003 and 2008, they increased the money supply by about 50%. Now, by any measurement over a five-year period, that's a rather dramatic uh, increase in the money supply. Now, the way they did this is that the Federal Reserve goes into what are called uh, the secondary market for government securities, and they bought securities uh, and paid with newly created money for those government uh, treasury securities. Banks then found themselves, because it was basically the banks that were selling government securities out of their portfolios, uh, banks found themselves with significantly larger reserves for lending purposes. And how do you get uh, a customer to buy more of a product 
if you have more to sell or your existing stock is not moving well you lower the price so in this case finding themselves with uh, a significant increase in the quantity of Federal Reserve created money in the banking system the banks lowered interest rates uh, and uh, those interest rates were pushed down that when adjusted for inflation for most of that five-year period were is in the negative range now what does it mean to talk about the negative range of interest rates imagine that uh, Jacob uh, you lend me a hundred dollars and I promise you a year from now to pay you back a hundred and two dollars well that's two percent interest rate on the principal now let's suppose the year comes to an end and you say I want my money Richard and I say of course Jacob I'm ready to pay you back and I hand you ninety eight dollars well you're not even getting back the value of the principal let alone the increment of additional interest income of the positive two dollars that I had originally promised that's what a negative interest rate when adjusted for inflation means that in real buying power in the market the lender is getting back less than what he had lent now the nominal amount of money will be the same but because of of inflation in between the nominal value of of that uh, of that principle is less so you're getting back less than you lent so from the borrower's point of view money was being basically given away for free and from the lender's point of view he was barely getting any return at all now this period 2003 and 2008 uh, is this recent financial bubble that we experienced the housing bubble the investment bubble the consumer debt bubble uh, consumers found that in relative terms uh, borrowing on uh, credit cards for consumer purchases was a bargain compared to putting your money in the bank to collect positive interest so consumer debt grew uh, it created a large investment boom at that time and then of course the housing boom by these artificially lowered interest rates so much so that uh, uh, the bubble finally burst in 2008 this was accompanied by the fact that not only was there a lot of money to lend at rock bottom interest rates for mortgage purposes but Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac the two government uh, housing uh, agencies we're basically telling uh, the financial institutions, the banks primarily responsible for mortgage lending, that we guarantee these loans to you. So if the loan goes bad, there's default or an arrears on payment, don't worry, we'll cover it for you. Or if you're even too nervous to hold the loan on your books, don't worry, extend the loan and we will immediately buy the loan from you and give you back the amount that you lent. So there's no risk for you. On top of that, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac under the influence of a number of people in Congress such as uh, uh, Barney Frank who was then from uh, from Massachusetts uh, was saying there's not enough lending to low-income people who deserve to have the American dream of everybody being in a house so as a consequence of this the banks were not only told that the loans are guaranteed but for you not to be accused of discriminatory lending power against certain minority groups or just being low income you need to lower your credit worthy standards so that reinforced what Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac would say extend a loan to someone who has no down payment extend a loan to someone who has, has, has a bad work history or a bad credit history don't worry because we guarantee you this so mortgages were given to a lot of people who by any more objective credit worthy standard should not have been sucked into a housing loan that they could not afford and since so many loans went belly up clearly could not sustain once the recession set in and people started losing their jobs it went to part time and so on so the Federal Reserve precisely by not leaving interest rates alone to be set by the market created the financial crisis and fiasco and downturn from which we're still recovering now apropos to what you were saying about the most recent statement all right hang on a second before yeah. we move up let's sure. talk a little bit more about that I mean what you're really saying then is that the government which encompasses the Federal Reserve right is or was the cause of the 2008 crisis yes in my humble opinion they along with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac influencing the housing market problem 
were the main were the main culprits of this. Yeah, well, you you certainly don't see this among progressives or liberals in the corrupted sense of the term, uh, or U.S. officials. I mean, they were going after bank executives and and accusing them of financial mismanagement, fraud, and so forth. Right. And they were pinning the blame for this debacle on them. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do you reconcile that with the notion that it was the government that was responsible? Okay. Suppose, let me use an analogy, okay? Let us suppose there is someone who is susceptible to alcoholism. And uh, he's fallen off the wagon several times in the past, but he's trying to stay on the wagon. And now someone comes into a, a restaurant and says, let me buy you a drink. And he persuasively tells the fellow, don't worry, what's one drink? You know, it's no problem. You know, I'm, I know you're trying to stay, you know, on the, on the wagon, but yeah, come on, it's my birthday, have a drink with me. And he, he buys the guy one drink and a second drink and a third drink and a fourth drink. Because he has this is psychological, even physiological weakness, okay? And now he gets drunk out of his mind. And now, rather than the guy who has extended him the free drinks in this way, uh, telling him not to drive, he says, go out, drive yourself home, and don't worry. If anything goes wrong, I'll cover the insurance costs of any accident you have. Now, the guy goes out, and having been given his weaknesses, gotten drunk and behind the wheel, smashes into another car and either injures or kills somebody. Now, what does the person do who is feeding him the drink, knowing his weaknesses and taking advantage of them? I'm shocked. I'm shocked. This person got drunk and he was so irresponsible that he got behind the wheel and injured or killed a person. You see, this person is terrible. There ought to be a law. It's not like a perfect one-to-one -one analogy, but in terms of the banks make money by lending money. And they have a proclivity to take advantage of opportunities when money comes their way. And if you have the Federal Reserve who says, look, here's all the money of the world. And don't worry about what any real interest rate or cost of money might be in a non-Fed inflationary environment. And then don't worry if you make bad loans because my buddy here, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, they're going to cover it. So it doesn't matter if you ruin people's lives, if you create a, a, a disastrous financial roller coaster in the housing market. Don't worry. And then when they cause this, I'm shocked that the banks have done this. Such irresponsibility. What? They should have known better than to, than to use this money this way. They should have known better than to put people who are uncredit worthy into houses they couldn't have put. There ought to be a law. You see what I'm saying? However imperfect the analogy, but you see what I'm getting at? That's what went on. Well, and I remember them talking exactly like that, too. I mean, you're, you're really depicting exactly their tone of voice. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and there ought to be a law. <laughs> but you, you're absolutely right. And the Austrian school has really emphasized this practically from the beginning, that, that, that when you have a central bank, which of course would not exist under under an Austrian free market monetary system, right. that it's it distorts your price system, it, it distorts your communication systems that yes. that comes with a free market, and by by flooding an economy with artificial money or credit, it sends the false signals to people, and it seemed to me that it, as part of this crisis, that people were simply responding to these signals these bank executives and lenders and so forth, they were, they were acting in their minds very rationally yeah. in, in accordance with these distorted warp signals that were coming to them. And then when the whole thing uh, falls through, because as the Austrians have long argued, this cannot be sustained in the long term, that the right. bubble is going to burst, then all of a sudden they look for scapegoats that the last thing they're going to do is, is, is take responsibility for what they've done. And you and I have talked about how they did this during the Great Depression, that when the stock market crash fell after the 1920s, the last thing they ever did was what they were going to do is to say, the stock market crash is a direct consequence of, of our failure to manage the money supply correctly. Right. Uh, instead, it's the failure of free enterprise. Blame it on the capitalists. We need regulation. This shows that we need more controls. Uh, and this was really, Richard, what, what 
uh, the framers were trying to avoid with with what was called the gold standard where right. you didn't have a central bank you you didn't you had gold and silver coins you didn't have paper or fiat money everybody understood that whatever paper instruments were out there were promises to pay money um, and that, that there really was a revolutionary change when America went off that gold standard, went to a central bank, and then we started getting what the Austrians have always called the booms and the busts. Well, unfortunately, uh, you're, you're right, but I would just sort of modify the historical circumstance. It is true that uh, through most of the 19th century and into the 20th century, uh, the United States was on a gold standard. And there was a peri period in the middle part of the 19th century then when there were imperfect forms of competitive private banking without a central bank. Uh, but beginning with the, the Civil War and Lincoln's need to finance uh, the Union side of the Civil War, he created a national banking system uh, and uh, flooded the economy with paper money uh, to fund his war. It was the worst inflation of the 19th century in the United States. Uh, and when the war was over, uh, there was still this in place, this this national banking system, uh, but with a return to a gold standard around 1873, if I remember correctly. Uh, but the fact is that, that what you had, and even when the Federal Reserve first began, uh, a managed gold standard, it was a central bank standard, uh, managed and controlled standard. But, but let, 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 let me at least say something about this. However, from the complete or full classical liberal libertarian point of view, uh, the separation of money from the state completely, that is no central banking of any sort, um, is the sort of the point on the horizon towards which we would like to move. There was a fact that in the 19th century, uh, in countries like Great Britain, uh, that the gold standard was viewed as the benchmark by which even that central bank most of the time would operate. In other words, banks controlled or overseen by the central bank would only increase the amount of currency money, paper money in circulation, whenever there was a fresh or new deposit of gold into the system. Since the currency notes were supposed to rep represent claims to the real money gold. And if there was a net withdrawal of gold out of the banking system, the notes would be returned in exchange for the gold, the deposit or withdrawing, and those notes would be extinguished. So there would be no increase in the supply of paper money in the banking system, which were claims to the gold, but which were facilitating, as money substitutes transactions, only if there were changes in the amount of real money in the banking system. It was more or less, and admittedly imperfectly, a monetary system and a money supply system that was to a great extent independent and free of direct and continuous government monetary manipulation. And that's what made it superior to what we've had over the last hundred years. And in that sense, it was a separation to a degree of money from the state because the central banks were expected to operate by a golden rule. These are the rules of the game. No gold in, no increase of the paper currency. Gold out, decrease of the paper currency. So the supply of money substitutes circulating in the economy for the convenience of not having to carry around gold and coins and bars was determined by market choices of depositors, suppliers, and miners of gold and not the government. And that's what made it superior. And that is what has been undermined and was destroyed uh, in the early decades of the 20th century. Well, yeah, because uh, since, since these, are, these are instruments of, of debt, Mm -hmm. People understood that if everybody comes and says, I want to be paid off, I want my gold coins, I've got this promissory note here or Federal Reserve note that promised me $20 worth of gold coins, I want it now, it's payable on demand, and right. everybody comes at the same time and there's not enough gold there, everybody knows there's going to be a problem there, right. and, and including the government. So the government had to be really careful on how yes. many instruments of debt it issued. Right. That was the constraining factor, even with a central bank. Correct. But, but once that went out the window, once they made gold illegal under the Roosevelt administration, imagine making the official money of the United States, it had been the official money for more than a hundred years, making it a felony offense to own. It is to me so incredible. 
that yes. everybody was required to turn in their, their, their gold coins, the official money, on pain of fine and imprisonment if they got caught as felons. Mm -hmm. And then now you have got the floodgates open because they can now print these instruments of indebtedness. And, and we still have remnants of that. When it says Federal Reserve note on the dollar bill, you know, hardly anyone ever asks, well, why is it a note? Why, right. why isn't it called Federal Reserve money, a $1 right, because, money? Right, because a note, if you look in the dictionary, uh, is still traditionally viewed as a claim or a promise to something else. It's like the old-fashioned way you'd go to the theater and you didn't want to have your hat or your coat on your lap during the performance. So you would go to the, 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 the coat room or the cloak room, as they used to call it, and you would hand in your, your hat and your coat and the woman at the counter would give you a claim check. This was a claim to that which was your real property. And when the performance was over, you would turn in the claim check. And either the theater gave it gratis as just part of your general ticket, or you paid a fee for this. And that's how the gold standard was. The paper money was not the money. It was a claim to the real money that you had deposited for safety and security with a financial institution for a, for a period of time. And that's what was broken. And what you eventually were told is, it would be the analogy, you go to the coat room at the end of the performance, you turn in the ticket, and you're told, wait, that's your coat and hat. No, they give you but another I, ticket. But I want my coat. And, well, the way I like to express it, Jacob, <laughs> is that let's suppose that you say, it says a note, you have a $20 bill, right? And you go into a bank and say, I, I want whatever this note is a claim to. And they give you two tens. And you right. say, but wait, I, no, I don't want the two tens. You turn in the two tens, they give you four fives. I don't want four. What? Exactly. Then they give you what? 20 ones. And then you turn that in and they give you, I can't do the arithmetic, you know, however many quarters and then nickels and dimes and pennies. Right. And then finally, when you turn back $20 worth of pennies, they hand you back a $20 bill. Right. It's like a circuit, you know, a circuit, a, like, like, like a merry-go-round. Exactly. Now, that, that is what has happened. Yeah, and, and they were... Throughout decade after decade after decade, and you've pointed this out in a great series in the in the ebook, Monetary Central Planning in the State, they're just flooding the economy with additional paper currency effectively. I mean, in, in, in the common parlance, they're cranking up the printing press and they're just printing the money away. And for a while, Richard, as you recall, when we were growing up, there were silver coins and silver dollars in circulation, silver quarters, yes. silver dimes. You'd use those in vending machines. But gradually, people started figuring out that there was so much paper out there that they started hoarding the silver. It was more valuable. I mean, why would you put a, a silver quarter into a vending machine instead of a cheap alloyed silver, uh, especially when the silver coin was selling for something much higher, like two silver, two alloyed coins? And so they drive, they drive the, the good coins under Gresham's law out of circulation to the point now where if you go and buy face value uh, a thousand a bag of a thousand dollars silver coins you know they they've, they've got quarters 25 cents but there's you add them up and it's a thousand dollars you can go out and sell that that bag of a thousand dollars of coins for what twenty thousand dollars or so now right. i mean this is what the fed has done to our money it's is is Rothbard said and other Austrians have said they're debasing it. They've destroyed the, what was really once the finest financial system in the world in history, and they they destroyed it. And so you end up with these booms and busts and debasement of the currency. That's a classic example of what happened in 2008. But now moving up to the to the present time, there's a lot of people have been arguing that that's all that they've been doing since 2008. They've been inflating a new bubble here and that yes. things are getting more and more and more inflated. And yes. some people are arguing that what happened in 2008 was just the tremor before the earthquake. And that's where I'm leaning. I think, I think we're heading in some real, real bad times when you consider the mountain of debt that continues soaring because of the welfare state spending, the warfare state spending, and then what the, the Fed's been doing with the quantitative easing. What, what's your take on that? Well, it is the case that when 2008, 2009 came, uh, the now the new Fed chairman, Al, uh, Ben Bernanke, with Alan Greenspan having uh, shortly before that uh, stepped down, uh, Ben Bernanke was a professor of economics at uh, Princeton. Uh, he's returned to that, I believe. Uh, and uh, he viewed himself as an expert 
on the history and the monetary economics of the Great Depression. And he believed that his view was, is that the Great Depression occurred because the Federal Reserve did not show the wisdom, the judiciousness, and the activist urgency to prevent a collapse of the banking system and the amount of money in the economy. Fearful that that was going to happen again. Uh, he decided to undertake with the assistance of the Treasury uh, a policy of, of, of expanding the amount of reserves in the banking system to save the banking system and to prevent what he considered a fall into the Great Depression, including arm, arm twisting of the banks. Uh, maybe some of the viewers will recall that in, um, uh, in the autumn of 2008, uh, when there was a concern with the Lehman Brothers and everything, uh, the, the, the heads of all the major banks of the United States, the CEOs, were ordered, and I use that not loosely, ordered to come to a meeting in Washington, D.C. at the Department of the Treasury. And, uh, and they arrived there, and they were met by Ben Bernanke and uh, Paulson, the Secretary of the Treasury. And they were lectured to for about an hour. This was, by the way, reported in great detail about two days later after this meeting uh, in, a, in, a, in, in a Washington Post article uh, that, uh, that several of the CEOs, who just asked not to be directly named, told about. Uh, that they were told that this is a major financial crisis and that it was necessary for the U.S. to pump in an, a large amount of money into their institutions to shore up their capital position to prevent a 1930s bank crash. Uh, and that they were going to be required to sell shares in their bank in exchange for the capital infusion from the U.S. Treasury with the assistance of the Federal Reserve. Uh, and they, they were go and, and they would they, 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 which basically meant that the United States government through the Treasury was now going to be a part owner of the primary uh, financial institutions of the U.S. through obviously stock ownership. Uh, now several banks, the Washington Post article emphasized, uh, several bank uh, CEOs got up at the meeting, including, if I remember correctly, Wells Fargo and one or two others. Their CEO said, "We don't need this money." Uh, we believe that this is a major financial crisis, but we look at our capital reserves, our, 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 our loan portfolio, and we think that we could easily weather the storm without the government uh, infusing money and holding shares, and therefore becoming part owner of our institutions. Uh, Paulson and Bernanke basically said no, because if some banks take the money and other banks choose not to, it will cause a panic because it will seem as if the, the banks that take the money are in dire straits of collapse right now. So therefore, all have to take the money and not just some. And they were told that none of these CEOs were going to leave the, tre the, the Treasury building until they had signed the documents shining over part ownership in exchange for these capital infusions. And they all signed by the end of the day and left. So, uh, uh, in fact, I did a piece at the time uh, on, on this event, and I call, said, called it the shotgun wedding between America's banks and, and, and the federal government, the shotgun wedding, because it literally was. It was the threat of a real arm twisting of saying, you're not leaving here until you sign over your shares for capital infusions that some of you don't want. Now, I don't want to create the impression that the banks were guiltless in the sense that they saw how the government had been playing the game. As we talked about just a little bit before, the guarantees from Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the, the huge amount of infusions of, of, of additional money for lending purposes from which they hoped to make profits. In, in fact, they realized that the, federal, that, that the federal government had set up a game that they could easily manipulate. And at Citibank, to just give one example, at Citibank, the, 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 the housing uh, mortgage officers told those who were their subordinates 
and actually uh, issuing loans to say it doesn't matter how low the applicant's standards and worthiness. Just say it meets, meets these, the, these Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac standards, bundle them together, issue the loan, the mortgages, bundle them together, and we're going to either sell them to someone who will buy them or we're just going to sell them to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac because we have the guarantee. In other words, they knew that they, the game was rigged and they realized that they could take advantage of it by not giving a damn about even meeting the lower standards that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So they, 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 their, hands, their hands were dirty because they took advantage of the crooked rules that the, that, 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 that the government agencies and the Federal Reserve had set up. And now, having gotten themselves into this position, they were happy, many of them, to take the government infusions of capital to save any problem for themselves. Now, again, because of research work that I was doing for an organization, uh, I was I was doing weekly analyses on this as this was unfolding. This was after I left fee, and uh, and I was following the uh, the unemployment statistics, Jacob. Okay, the unemployment statistics. What was happening each month? You know, because you know the the, the Department of Labor reports. You know, what's the overall unemployment rate? What's the unemployment rate in in the, in the housing sector, in the in the automobile sector, in the food sector? Blah blah blah, including the financial. And banking sector. And guess what? You watch the data every month, you know, rising unemployment, obviously, in housing construction, rising unemployment in, in the automobile industry, blah, 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 blah. You know, the one sector of the economy, besides the government, of course, that had unemployment, the banks, from the CEO to the teller, not a person lost their job. Why? Because they were saved from their dirty work with the people who had fostered it in government. Right. Talk about a government business partnership, okay? A government business partnership. And there was no unemployment because they were bailed out by their partners in crime. To use one other analogy, maybe some viewers know the famous Humphrey Bogart movie, Casablanca. And there's a scene in which uh, he, the, the, the prefect of police in Casablanca, uh, Colonel Renault, is instructed by a, a Nazi officer to shut down the cafe. And, and Rick, who's played by Humphrey Bogart, comes up to him and says, on what grounds, on what grounds are you closing me? And, and, and Captain Renault, the prefect of police says, I'm shocked, I'm shocked to find out there's gambling going on here. <laughs> and the croupier from, from the roulette game comes up with a handful of French francs in his hand and says to, the, to C Captain Renault, you're winning, sir. Okay, I mean, this is the game, okay? This is the damn game between the symbiotic relationship between the, the Federal Reserve, the government agencies, and the banks. They made bundles out of this cheap and artificial money, and then when, to save them having any problems, they happily took the capital infusion, which ran the risk of being at the taxpayer's expense. Yeah, you know, the one fascinating part about this is that many people on the left get this. I mean, they, they, they understand the, the corruption of this government business partnership getting into bed with each other. And so you had this phenomenon during the Ron Paul campaign where libertarians were saying in the Fed. And then you had all of the, the, the left at those, uh, I forget what it was called, uh, the protest sites that they had four years ago and stuff where, where they were set up tents and stuff. Uh, right. Where they had signs, I saw them out in California, they were carrying signs that says in the Fed also. Right. Uh, and unfortunately, you don't see that, those signs at all in this presidential campaign. Maybe right. they'll stop, start popping up if the Johnson well ticket starts rising. But you got people like Trump and Hillary who are as committed to this way of life as, as any statist in the world. Right. They love the Federal Reserve. They know that it, it amplifies the power of the executive. And uh, it's really just destroying America. Uh, Richard, we're out of time, but why don't you give us a quick perspective on, on what you see with this Brexit uh, vote that's coming up this week in a couple of days, actually. Okay. Yes. Uh, for, for, the list, for the viewers and listeners, Brexit is sort of like the little coin term made for Britain's exit from the European Union. Now, Great Britain is not part of the euro currency, the common euro currency. There is still the British pound, but they have been part 
of the European Union, the old European Economic Community. Uh, and they, they are now going to be having a vote on Thursday of this coming week, of this week, uh, on whether to withdraw or not. All of the public opinion polls show that the vote is extremely close and in the margin of error in the statistical sense. So nobody knows how this is going to play out. Though in the market today, and we're doing this on Monday, uh, the, 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 the stock market in the U.S. has gone up by over 200 points as of this morning with the idea, oh, the polls are suggesting that Britain will stay in, they won't go out. Now, I happen to be uh, a proponent of uh, British withdrawal because the fact is, is that while the, uh, while, while the common market, as it used to be called, which was set up in uh, the mid-1950s, was meant to be a common free trade zone. That was how it was packaged, and for a while that was its basic ideal. Uh, no more protectionism, no more trade barriers. Uh, try to make as much of Europe a free trade zone as trade between the states of the United States. Uh, no, no, no import duties, no export restrictions, and so on. And to gain the benefits of division of labor and greater productivity, and, uh, and uh, the idea being is that trade uh, reinforces peace, and maybe that will help to make it less likely that European countries would go to war, all meritorious ideas and principles. But as the 1960s became the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, uh, th th there emerged this belief, which was in the minds of some from the beginning who were proponents of the common market, that, uh, that it would be necessary to make this more than a free trade zone among member countries, but to make it a political entity and unit that would have a common uh, economic policy over everything, uh, a common fiscal policy, and the ideal being a common currency. So what you basically have now is a vast bureaucracy in the European Union capital of Brussels in Belgium that is uh, appointed by member governments. Uh, there is a parliament that, that, that is elected by, by the citizenry of the member countries but have no influence, no power, uh, and, and no poll, you basically have a centralized bureaucracy uh, with great autonomy of decision making working in deals with the member governments uh, for subsidies, for, 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 for special uh, 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 handouts, uh, for, for special trade restrictions and, and benefits, uh, all with the exp and, and a vast network of common business regulation. That, that is one of the major reasons for the stifling of growth in the European Union, in my humble opinion, and the persistence high unemployment of an average unemployment rate for the EU countries as a whole of 10%, persistently for over a decade now, where in some member countries, such as Spain, Italy, and certainly Greece, it's higher, and where youth unemployment, that is between 16 and 25, in Spain, unemployment is 25% of people in that young age category. The same in, in Greece, it's 50%. Uh, France is very high. Uh, and particularly among the, the, the Muslim minority community in France. So as a consequence of this, the, the, this rigid spider's web of regulations and controls that is under no one's authority and responsibility, and certainly not to the citizen voters of the member country, they have become disillusioned, they've become disappointed, they've become frustrated, including in Britain, which, which now is having this plebiscite or this referendum, if you will. Uh, and in addition, there has been a disappointment in immigra the, the, the seemingly non-immigration policies, either positive, negative, uh, the, the, this xenophobic fear, it's not a part of this that I approve of, the xenophobic fear of you know, this invasion of non-Europeans as epitomized by the million uh, people from the Middle East who, and North Africa who showed up last year. Uh, so there are xenophobic and, and nationalist elements to, to this uh, anti-EU movement. But in general, and particularly for Great Britain, I believe that there's minimal xenophobia, uh, minimal interest in economic protectionism, but just to get away from the taxes and the regulatory stranglehold and the non-representative arrogant bureaucracy uh, of, of the EU structure. And for that reason, uh, I am as strongly in sympathy with a yes vote for British withdrawal coming this Thursday. It remains to be seen whether it will be successful or not. Yeah, well, it, it, I noticed today in the New York Times the, the EU countries are resorting to threats that yes. they're saying if you get out, you're going to pay a very high price because we're going to make sure you pay a high price. So things could get nasty. 
if they do exit. And uh, as you're suggesting, things are going to get nasty even if they stay in just because of the structure. Yes. Um, on that note, Richard, uh, we, we're running out of time. Uh, enjoyed it as always. Right. And we should try to continue at some point to deal with the fiscal and monetary policies going on since the crash of 2008, which we unfortunately ran out of time to discuss. But that has been as bad as the policies preceding the crash. Oh, sounds good. Maybe we'll, we'll, we'll discuss that next time. Thank you very much for tuning in, and we'll see you all next week.